first of all, I would like to thank uh, Joel, Gabby, and the uh, Sustainable Collective Fashion for inviting me. This is, uh, this is truly collective. Uh, and it is collective because um, uh, I'm a marine biologist, and I never thought one day I would speak at a fashion conference. <laughs> and, uh, and here I am. And so I think this is great. And this is how to connect and how to make the circularity of things go uh, well. So, I would like to talk about your area of fashion in a very different way. So I, I will you know, try to address two different topics and uh, that relate very well to the panel that we had earlier and what was the first speaker that Elizabeth was talking about. So uh, all will make sense and it will give you probably more thoughts <coughs> for, for lunch. And so if you can dim the light a little bit uh, in the front, yeah. it would be great. Um, no, so what happens is I'm an evolutionary biologist and uh, don't worry, there will be only you know two minutes of science here. <laughs> <laughs> so what do I think is that millions of years ago uh, planet Earth was this grey hostile environment and then we evolved into this beautiful colorful place that we know now. And if you want to model that very simply into the squares being the places where the animals live, and the animals being the actual circle that you see here. There's a bee here. I'll try to avoid that. So you see the circles are the animals. As, as an animal, you want to either blend in where you live, or you want to stand up. You want to be seen, like these guys here, or you want to just say, you know, invisible, you have a hard time seeing it. Evolution has led that to the same thing as a of years ago, but now we have colors added to it in many ways to make color, and that's part of what my lab does. And so, how do you experience that? If you look at nature and try to mimic nature, which is the field of biomimicry, it's exactly what you go to. In nature, you see things like that, many organisms from flatworms to fish to uh, you know, little stars and crabs see they are totally well adapted to the background, or they will be totally standing up. Very colorful messages telling you, hey, I'm not going to eat, I should be, you know, not the great, uh, you know, organism to, uh, to eat because they, there are some warning signals. Animals also use light, and uh, to use light uh, is the same thing that when you we're a kid and we're probably chasing butterflies and smearing them somewhere and see how beautiful it is. Uh, they do that for signaling and they actually use that not for the pleasure of their eyes but for their own purpose. Many organisms do that in the ocean and uh, many organisms do that so that they can be seen. So I'm a marine biologist so I have a lot of my research focused on, on the water and the organisms living in it. Uh, but also like to go uh, above water and like many uh, evolutionary speaking, spiders, birds all use color to attract attention. Bird is showing its neck, say, ooh, look at this, red, green, you know. And so does the spider. And what's different here is that uh, we actually do exactly the same. This is what fashion is like for me. We doing we dress is basically based on it. what message do you want to give to people? Do you want to attract someone to look at you? Do you want to blend in? And so obviously I'm not in the fashion industry, but this is what I can download from the world. And I think there is a lot of things to say about how the fashion is designed to communicate the signal. And we sometimes tend to forget about what are the materials that we use to communicate the signals. Animals use very natural materials, but we don't. So this is what we are going to talk about. Um, as I said, animals use these colors so that they can blend into the environment. And we as humans, we don't use materials that allow us to preserve the environment. Instead of having materials that keep our environment beautiful and colorful, we actually turn it into something much earlier and grayer than full of plastics, which is the focus of the talk today. 
how do I consider fashion in terms of the material that we use? The material that you use, woven and non-woven material, are made of fibers. And most of these fibers are unnatural. It's, you know, we, we can talk about the issue of cotton at some point. <laughs> but what's important is that you should wash, you know, people wash their clothes more or less regularly. And as you wash them, you release fibers into the sound up. You release fibers into the uh, can you turn the sound up there on that side? Because uh -huh. I have the sound there. No. <coughs> so you have the um, you have the washing machine up there, and as you wash your clothes, you basically break your clothes and garment down and you release fibers. In the old days, the first stage of washing machine would have filters. The same kind of filters that you have in the dryers. Those filters have been kept around in Europe and in Japan, but not in the US, because the manufacturer thought, well, those filters get clogged and we have to change it. That's so much work, right? <laughs> and, so, uh, and so we remove the filters and now everything that gets clogged actually goes in the waters. And, uh, and so uh, we are polluting our environment with all the filters we're actually using. And now you can actually use and buy those filters kind of box. You put that by then and they, they actually catch about 90% of the microfibers. The same way for the uh, dryer, you can actually collect the lint from your uh, filter. And the lint is basically uh, most of the fibers that are released from your garments, but uh, not all of it, unfortunately, since the small ones are always in the air. So, uh, as I said here in this, we, are, we have water, airborne and waterborne uh, fibers uh, as you, uh, are, that are associated with just the fact of wearing your, uh, your clothing. And that's important to know because uh, we are made of water. We rely on water, we drink water, we, we have water everywhere. But, and we breathe too, right? And so those are the two main uh, ecosystems that we rely on. Is just breathing and and uh, and uh, drinking, and we are part of our ecosystem. And so everything you put in the water, the air, will eventually go back to you. Meaning that you and I are drinking and breathing plastics. That's for sure. This impact of plastics in the marine ocean has been already well known. Uh, you know about the straws and the all the plastic bags and all the awful pictures that we see, and and that's great, not for the environment, that's great because it's a powerful message that our kids, our responsible adults can grasp and can take action on. The problem is that there are many, many things out there in the environment that are not visible. The only thing that you know that are visible are, you know, the straws and the, the things like that. But also what is not visible is the same thing, but is remaining as long as your plastic bottle. So we have plastic <coughs> items that are very, very small, invisible, that can remain 600 years. <coughs> and who knows what they do and what impact they have. When you do look at those reports on the effect of plastics on the environment, it's interesting to see that you have always the regular culprits and the regular water bottles and Q-tips, etc., etc., but you start having now more and more the effect of textiles right here. Textiles are a big component of the plastic pollution, and we have to be reminded of that. This is where it's So, um, what I'm trying to see what's going on here. So, the pollution of the plastic <coughs> is very important here. Yeah, we'll just respect the computer.
So the, I will speak and then you will see the images. So, <laughs> so what happens is that the, um, the industry is, uh, is focused on durability of materials, which is great because we can just buy garments that will last forever. Uh, but that has all the problems that comes with that is the fact that, of course, uh, you have more and more garments being produced and they are being shipped everywhere and they don't degrade. And so the whole concept of fast fashion where you have something that might actually be turned around, uh, turns around and that accumulates somewhere in the world, but also degrades quite a bit. And so uh, the impact of microfibers and microplastic is, uh, is very big into, uh, in the environment. And uh, what we see is that we uh, drink water, we drink beer, wine, and all this is actually containing microfibers. 90% of water resource in the US contains microfibers. And when I saw that information first, I'm like, yeah, boy, whatever, I don't believe that's true. I went to the local store and uh, you know, took water bottles from the, uh, you know, spring water bottles and then look at whether I could find microfibers in the I didn't try the beer, I probably the beer afterwards. I <laughs> <laughs> had a few beers here. Uh, but <laughs> um, So, uh, the 
big difference between microplastics and microfibers. If a bottle breaks down into small pieces, imagine that you have very small microplastics. You ingest it, and the likelihood is that you will you'll be feeling full because you thought that you ate something and you have not actually ate something that has nutritional value. If you use microfibers like what we have, what we wear right now, the chemistry is different. Microfibers are designed to absorb smell, sweat, water, whatever you clean your car with. All those microfibers are reactive. They are reactive, they are designed like here to have a structure and to have a chemistry that is designed to absorb everything. And that means that when it goes into the ocean, it will pick up all the contaminants. And then you drink that, you eat that, you breathe it. And so that's where the problem is. So, microfibers have only one thing that is good for me. My lab does a lot of imaging in fluorescence, which is when you use black lights, you see the invisible, like in the CSI and all that stuff. And so we can now detect these microfibers, which is very important. It is important because, like was said in the room earlier, some people are skeptical when things are not visible from industries. It's the same when I talk to some students, say, we are breeding microfibers. Yeah, right. I say, well, let's try it. Bring a filter here, you filter the room, and yes, it will be microfibers in this room. And so making things visible provides a tool to communicate to <coughs> the, uh, students and to the public how uh, important it is to study these aspects. And so uh, my lab does a lot of research where the first thing is where are those microfibers? Who makes them? Is it truly related to just us wearing clothing, or is it related to the manufacturing process? Or is it related to when we burn? So we map those microfibers all around the world. We have an association with Greenpeace, with the Trenchard Foundation, with the Trenchard Canada. We collected fibers, or at least samples, in the North Pole, in Antarctica, K2, in the deep sea, and so far, every single sample has happened. Every single one from the North Pole, even. So they were not red, so it's not Santa, I can tell you that. They are the microfibers coming from the winds being dropped all the way to the North Pole. And so, what can we do now? Right? We are responsible citizens. What do we do? What do we tell your kids? The good bit friend is one of them, it's like everything that you have that is synthetic, you should. Try to collect the fibers from it. There are some filter bags that you can use. You can use that with the thread. You can monitor the ocean waves, that's what we do. You can put a, a washing machine filter which collects 90%. All these can be tested, and that works. Now in California, these filters will become the law for any single new homes that will be built and where you will have a washing machine installed. Uh, they will have, they will be required to have these, these, uh, these filters. And so, uh, it's important to know that there is not much we can do for all the microfibers that are already in the environment and in the air. But why? Because they are so small. And the only thing we can do is that if the more water we drink, the more we breathe, the more our bodies will filter them, and that's about it. We are the living filters. No, I'm not sure it's a good thing. But. So, but the hard thing we do is work at the source. And working at the source means that we should work with the... Uh, oh, no. So we can work with the industry. We can work with the industry so that we can actually change the level of microfibers that are produced from the start. Making clothes, making fashion that is more sustainable, and making sure that we can actually uh, work with uh, companies that produce a set of fibers that, when you put them in the environment, they don't last for 600 years. And for that, we work with a company that was uh, you know, mentioned before, Lensing. And Lensing is in the forefront of innovation 
by uh, doing fibers that are inspired from nature. We make something uh, uh, to, to help us fit into a our environment. Uh, let's make it sure that when it degrades, when it goes back into the environment, it degrades. So Lenzing makes uh, fibers for biocell, many cell, uh, different types of fibers that are made in the cellulose, and those fibers uh, we are testing whether or not they degrade. And so that's a great, uh, great in, uh, interaction between the industry and academia, which is very rare, and uh, I think that's where uh, the, the forward thinking and the forward thinking of this company is going to come from. Uh, I would love to actually meet with some of the CEOs of uh, Walmarts and uh, even uh, uh, Target, which I thought were very bad brands that I never wanted to deal with, and they would each about the five to ten million dollar in research to get plastics to bring one of the questions I was asked earlier. So, so these brands have a bad uh, connotation. We are all skeptical about them, but I think they are conscious about it and they are you know, starting to put some uh, some funds towards uh, addressing that problem. And so, the type of research that we do, we work on on fabric, and uh, not only that, but in this particular project with. Uh, with lensing. And so we take the fabric that are made to be at the base of what you wear. And that can be anywhere from uh, natural fabric, cotton, organic cotton, and so forth, and hemp, to uh, different synthetic materials. <coughs> so and then we want to have a really wide assessment. If you put that in the water, imagine you lose a t shirt. Does it degrade? Does it fall apart? How long does it take? Those questions are accepted. So we, we have the opportunity at Scripps where I work, we have pride on the, on the ocean, so we can put these coupons into these pages, uh, and then uh, we drop that in the ocean and we keep that for, for weeks at a time. What you can see here, uh, for example, is that um, for the purpose of, uh, of this particular presentation, as we don't want to name any kind of, of fibers or coupons, but the ones that disappear are natural. The ones that do not are synthetic or semi-synthetic. Uh, we are not about uh, six months of these materials in the water. Some of them here have only barely changed color, but they have not changed by months. They look exactly the same. They just have a little bit more bio following a little bit things for them on them. But synthetic material takes at least months and months and months to degrade. Right. So this is what uh, the kind of research that I do. Now what's interesting is that we work on just the raw material of those fibers. The problem that the industry has is that we functionalize the fibers. You want to make them really protected. So you combine fibers with titanium. You want to make them colorful, so we combine them with a lot of dyes. The thing that we are looking at uh, having access to either we are for uh, you know water repellent uh, protective materials. The point is that what we wear is not only it's a combination of products and chemicals that are that we shed back into our environment that we breathe and we drink, and that's uh, the problem. <coughs> So the bigger message is, uh, of course, microplastics are ubiquitous. We know plastic, we know all the sustainable aspects that we have to do with the larger pieces of plastics. But, of course, uh, microfibers are very important. Uh, we have to look at where they are produced, how we can limit them. Uh, very important because, uh, to my opinion, uh, if you catch a fish, uh, in a place that is uh, subject to winds that we bring microfibers, the likelihood is that you're going to eat more plastic than what you want. And the problem is that today there is no studies that will address the effect of plastic on the health. We don't know. Irritation, asthma, cancer, maybe. I talk to people in the government trying to bring the issue of plastic for human health and public health. And we say, well, there is no proof it does anything. There is nothing we can do. Mm -hmm. Not send 
practice at the time when uh, we had the cigarette problem, uh, <coughs> that's the same, the same thing that we are, we are facing here. And so, we are also looking at all the different steps of make the farm product of what we wear to make sure that things are sustainable all the way through, including at the end what we talked about earlier in the panel is that, you know, that when the top, all the processes to transport those uh, finished materials uh, back and forth to different, uh, different places where they are being sold. And so, as I said, using natural fabric is important and uh, it's important because people have used color, you know, for ages. Uh, I was born and raised in Africa and I grew up in places <coughs> where we were wearing nothing synthetic, so all natural and uh, very powerful and it has been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. Why this shift suddenly? Well, compounds and products that are basically uh, not known of their effect on the environment including public health. And so that's my take for the merge of marine biology with the fashion industry. And as a marine biologist, you know, we publish uh, several papers and everything, but the paper that had the most impact which is not a paper, actually, it's an article that we had in Kindle Magazine. Mm -hmm. Where we actually had a call from, from Congress to talk about this. Because this, uh, this article about your yoga pants leaving the water you drink has such a big impact. And it does have an impact if you are a conscious person who wants to exercise, be healthy, and keep our environment safe. Uh, we need to make sure that we publish, we communicate, we talk to audiences that are not just in my field, and this is why I'm here today. And this is why I'd like to thank Joel and Gabby and uh, all the other people from the Sustainable Collective uh, uh, DC uh, chapter, and uh, thank you for your attention.
in an aquarium with controlled water flow, where we can actually monitor the amount of microfibers that are released by the material breaking down. And so in this case, what I showed you was only the, uh, you know, what is left from breaking down. But all those microfibers, all these, all the things that disappear, indeed release microfibers. Now, the fact that they disappear means that they are really loose, that they, they, they release microfibers, but all these materials that are breaking down are natural microfibers. Uh, you know, hemp and, 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 uh, and cotton and silk and all these, and these are products that are known to just be uh, degraded easily by, uh, by bacteria, microbes, and other things. So we can, we don't want to reinvent the wheel, but we are monitoring that, and more especially, our great interest in into the uh, semi-synthetic and into PLAs. Uh, PLAs is the polylactic acid, which is this new uh, replacement of plastic. It's made by bacteria, and there are controversial claims on whether or not PLA is degradable or not. And we are addressing that because even though it's Companies sell it as a bioplastic because it's made by biology. Does that mean it's degradable? <coughs> There's a lot of materials that nature does that are not biodegradable either, just because you know, take hydrogen or something like that, it's very hard to And so we are in that stage. So that experiment there, we can talk about the various aspects of, of, of the experiments. And that was just to show that very few industries assess the realistic um, settings of this study. Uh, we work with lensing and with other um, industries that look at when they make garments, they look at the degrade and their test of degradation is basically taking a bioreactor, so an environment fully closed where control temperature, control pH, control everything, we usually at 50 C, 50 degrees Celsius, which is definitely not the temperature that we experience uh, in many different, many places in the world. And uh, they put specific <coughs> microbes in it. And if the grade is great, it's very degradable. But these conditions are not very easy. This is the gray in the ocean, the realistic environment that is changing, that has a variety of microbes and other things. <coughs> that was the point of the uh, this experiment. One more? You can? Yes? I am curious about the intersection between your work and Hillary's work um, with how we can have, uh, I'm a law student here, and we all know about the case of Johnson and Johnson just lost about the public nuisance, and so I'm curious if there are <coughs> You know, in the scientific field, if there's been any action working with lobbyists, working with people on the Hill to enact legislation that includes um, ceilings on microfiber emissions isn't necessarily the correct word, but if we have a movement towards limiting microfibers, limiting um, or perhaps requiring certain certifications, if you say this is a bioplastic, but no, that just that can't just mean that it's made from biology. But does degrade in a single way? Well, I think that that's a very quick and if you want to jump in, but uh, uh, the answer is no. There is no effect whatsoever, and this is the reason why we are monitoring uh, the uh, air and waters so that we can have a, a baseline of uh, what are the levels of many factors. Uh, we actually were lucky to um, work with uh, neuroscientists that are, have been monitoring waters for the last 40 years and that have kept water bottles for the last 40 years. They collect water every, every twice a week. And uh, so we have access to about 2,000 samples going back to the 80s. And we look at, is there, I mean, if it's synthetic fibers, it will stay. And so is the fiber. So we can have a baseline. And based on that, we can just start to go and try to establish correlation, causality maybe with the increase of the health issues in the communities, depending on where these values are and how much they increase. So that's number one. Number two, um, we brought the aspect of cosmetics. We work also on cosmetics because that's what touches people most. 
um, because many the industry uses microplastics, the microbes for abrasion, abrasion and everything. And that is a way that we can address the uh, policy much easier than by saying, like, stop wearing your jacket and you know, probably it's like people who it's much less of an impact as opposed to something that you actually wear put on your skin and that has the purpose of being absorbed by your skin and has, has, has a function. And so I think we are slowly making progress on orange in terms of scientists, uh, the fact that we team up with, uh, you know, organizations like Greenpeace, uh, it's big because uh, they, collect, they are collecting samples basically all over the world for us. We analyze them and then we work to establish a, a, a baseline. And then the fact that I'm here, I think these are the, the first steps that we can uh, say, okay, well, there is scope that we can bring that to the next level. Uh, and then, you know, next year we'll see where, where we are. Thank you.